lot of ideas about Yom Kippur and Yom Teruah and the Feast of Sukkot. Unfortunately, we just don't know yet because these are the holy days that have not yet been fulfilled. I mean, probably minor fulfillments, as you know how prophecy goes, where it's like got a minor fulfillment and then it gets a little bit more fulfilled. We're waiting for the full fulfillment of these final three uh, feast days when the Messiah returns. I think everybody's aware of that. Notice, I, I, something occurred to me, and I just want to bring this into your awareness briefly. Notice that we haven't blown the trumpets yet. Okay, Now, it's not because we haven't sighted a, a, a sliver of a moon. Uh, what is interesting to me, and it got me thinking this week, is often, how many of you, I'll ask a question, you can buy a show of hands either online or in person, what, when you have blown the shofar on Yom Teruah in the past, is this a shout of joy and praise and everybody's, it's, this is awesome, we're excited, we're joyous, is that what it is or is it somber and serious? How, how many would you, how many of you would say, this is joy, this is joyous? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's a great insight. Let me see hands online. Anybody online? Hands for for uh, joy. This is a joyous thing. Okay, David Branton has raised his hand. Okay. Do the rest of you who have not raised your hand, do you consider it to be a little more somber, a little more serious, a little more trepidatious, shall we say? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. And I began to think about that. And I have in the past, I got to tell you, when we've blown those shofars, it has been a joyous occasion but I'm feeling a little uncomfortable about that after having done my study this week uh, and over the last couple of weeks I'm a little bit nervous about that and I'll tell you why in a moment and I don't want to necessarily change your perspective maybe it will maybe it won't I just want you to contemplate this okay so the bottom line is I want us to approach the scriptures that we're going to take a look at, and then we'll blow our shofars. But I want our scriptures to shape our attitude. I think that's an important consideration. What does the scripture say about this day? And how are we supposed to approach this day? Not necessarily as the Jews approach this day, although I, I'm, I wouldn't come against our Jewish brothers and sisters and how they observe this day. They have some wonderful and interesting insights regarding this day. Um, about how our Christian brothers and sisters approach this day, they don't. They don't really know anything about it at all, if very few do. I think that there is a maybe a minor sense that Yeshua is going to come and there's going to be a trumpet sound, but I don't think they really connect those things at all for most of them. Um, but these three Moedim, Yom Teruah, Yom HaKippurim, the Feast of Coverings, Atonements, and Sukkot are not yet fulfilled. So our conception is going to be highly speculative. But the scriptures will give us some very interesting things to think about. These scriptures will be suggestive, but be careful, because we're not totally certain what's going on there. I don't want us to fall into the trap that our brothers and sisters fell into uh, a couple thousand years ago, where everything they thought was a literal going to happen literally was spiritual and everything they thought was spiritual was literal. They got everything flipped around on its head. So I want to be careful when we're looking at end times prophecy and the way it's going to shake out that we don't get caught with the same perception of, oh, we thought this was going to be that and we thought this was going to be that and we're just completely confused and don't know what to think. I have always mentioned, and I'll mention one more time just for confirmation, be very careful with the, word, the pictures that you play with in your mind about how it's going to look and all that stuff. So it's very challenging. So the first thing I want to do is I want to share my screen with you and take a look at the passages from the, the Torah, which tell us a little bit about uh, Yom Teruah. If anyone online would be willing to show me a thumbs up that they can see that slide. Delightful. Thank you very much. David Branton. You have your hand raised. Is that a thumbs up so you can see the slide, or do you want to speak? 
Oh, that was a thumbs up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, cool. So here are a couple of passages that deal with, uh, here it is, yes. Leviticus 23, 23, if you'd like to open your Bible. Leviticus 23, 23, and you can also put your thumb in Numbers 29 if you'd like. These are the two passages that deal with Yom Teruah. That means the day of shouting, blowing, alarms, trumpets, <laughs> horns, cries of distress, however you want to interpret the word truah. Leviticus 23.23, it says, And Yah spoke to Moshe, that is Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you are to have a rest, a remembrance of blowing, a holy assembly. You do no servile work, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yah. This is what it tells us to do. Very, very clear, right? You know exactly what to do. Numbers 29 Verse 1 says, And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you have a holy assembly. You do no servile work. It is a day of blowing for you. Notice that the, uh, the, the wording around the word uh, truah is slightly different. In Leviticus, we have a remembrance of truah. And in Numbers 29, we have a day of Teruah. Now, it's fairly recognizable to see that our Hebrew brothers and sisters for a couple thousand, three thousand years have been blowing shofars and trumpets and making noise on this evening. And you can understand why. The question always comes up in regards to Leviticus 23, a remembrance of blowing. And we're not totally certain what we're remembering, okay? It could very well be what? What is the best guess? The ten words. The ten words spoken from Mount Sinai. Because that's the only time that we're aware of where they heard a trumpet blowing, uh, you know, a shofar blowing uh, prior to this instruction being given out. Which is interesting because we have a different holy day, as far as we know, to celebrate that. That's Shavuot. That's Pentecost, when those ten words were given. So it's slightly unusual that we would commemorate the ten words over two separate holy days. Certainly interesting. Now, I want to answer a couple of questions for you. First of all, truah, clamor acclamation of joy or a battle cry, especially a clangor of trumpets like an alarm. And you can trace, and it's a great idea to do this throughout the scriptures, that word uh, truah is appearing throughout the scriptures lots of times, okay? In the, in the uh, Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, as well as in the Greek scriptures. It's obviously a different word in the Greek, but it's pretty easy to trace. You got the walls of Jericho, walking around and blowing the trumpet seven times and then the walls fall down. That's a great one. You got the horn being blown and the coronation of the king. You got very lots of very interesting uh, blowings of trumpets and silver trumpets. And I think one of, the, uh, one of the most interesting ones, and I would encourage you to look at this uh, in your own time, is in Numbers it talks about the blowing of these silver trumpets that, that caused the camps of Israel to move out and in their orders. That, I think, is an, a, a fascinating uh, precognition, if you will, of the people being gathered and moved from place to place. Fascinating. But I, I think more than anything this evening, I want to just cover a couple of things and, and cause you to think about what this day means for you and what it might mean for you in the future. So the question is, who is it for? Who's supposed to do this? Okay, now I would show you this passage, and I think that this passage is really instructive for anything that you want to talk about in the Bible. This is Numbers 15, 
And I'm sure you're very much aware of this passage where it says in Numbers 15 and 14, when a stranger sojourns with you or whoever is among you throughout your generations and would make an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yah, as you do, so he does. One law is for you of the assembly and for the stranger who sojourns with you. A law forever throughout your generations. As you are, so is the stranger before Yah. That's you. Many of you are strangers and aliens and sojourners who have joined themselves to Israel, been grafted into that olive tree, just like Paul tells us. So, one law for everybody. And we know that. I, I, uh, I know you all know that, but I think it's worth repeating. There is not two sets of instructions. You wouldn't give one set of instructions to one child and another set of instructions to a different child. That would be very confusing. Then <laughs> one child's going to be angry. So, don't do that. Uh, but, this is for you. No questions about it. This is for you. Um, when do we do it? In the seventh month, on the first day of the month. Uh, most people follow the Hillel 2 calendar, which is what we're doing right now. That's why we're meeting this evening, because of trying to synchronize the calendar for everybody. It's happening right now, uh, which is a calculated calendar. Many of you Messianics, and myself included, like to cite the moon to see you know, when is the actual biblical month. But hey, we gotta get, we got to have a plan, right? So you can't really have a plan when you got to cite something tough to do. That's why they made this calendar. Uh, so the elders of Israel systematized this for the exiles. We are in exile, right? We're not living in the land. Um, now, so what do we do? Well, the Tanakh passages that we've just reviewed, it is not abundantly clear. It's a memorial of blowing. And I, I think this is just, this is what is cautious. We have to be cautious about this. And it's difficult to understand because it hasn't been fulfilled yet. We don't know what it's going to look like when he does come to fulfill it. But you have passages I know you're thinking of right now in the, the New Testament Greek scriptures where there's several messages about shofars being blown and a rapture, a, a gathering up, the harpazo, uh, gathered into the clouds and meeting the Lord in the air. And we're going to look at those passages in a moment. Um, I, think, I think it's instructive to look at, as, as with all things that the Jews have done with the holy days, that they've been doing for thousands of years, we Christians come along and we look at what they're doing and we see our Messiah in their practices, right? I mean, if you've ever uh, observed a uh, traditional Passover Seder for, or for Passover, you know that there's all kinds of symbolism and very interesting things that happen in a Jewish Seder, which to us are very clearly about the Messiah. It's just unmistakable. Now, what do our brothers, the Jews, do during Yom Teruah, uh, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Sukkot? If you study that and see what they do, it can be very instructive for you as a Christian, as a follower of the Messiah, because it just makes so much sense, okay? So I want to just briefly review, and I know that many of you already know this, but I think it bears repeating. You know, I think you guys are aware that the Bible repeats itself like a million times, right? It's only a handful of instructions repeated over and over and over and over. <laughs> it's not that complicated. Um, but... One of those things that it can be confusing is if you look at a calendar, it doesn't say Yom Teruah at all. What does it say? You go to Google, for example, or whatever, and you say, oh, I'm looking for the Feast of Trumpets. They don't call it that at all. It's Rosh Hashanah. Now, that can be a slightly confusing for people because how many times does the word Rosh Hashanah appear in the Bible? Huh? It's like, yeah. One time. It does appear one time. The words Rosh Hashanah appear in the Hebrew text one time. That is in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 1. Now what's interesting is the Septuagint, which was those 70 elders of Israel translating the Hebrew text into Greek a couple of hundred years before Yeshua came. How did they translate that? They literally translated that in the first month. 
they literally translated the words Rosh Hashanah in, into in the first of month, which we know biblically the first month is what? Aviv, which is in the spring, not in the fall. So, yet yeah, now there, so there's a lot of confusion out there in Hebrew root circles and Messi and Messianic Judaism about well, what is this Rosh Hashanah thing? That is a very interesting thing, and I think it's slightly off the topic that I want to deal with. But it's the, Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year according to the Jewish civil calendar when kings are coronated and the shofar is blown on this day to set captives free at the beginning of the seventh year after their six years of servitude. So that's very interesting stuff. And there's a lot of instructive prophetic ideas there as well. Uh, but what I think that we need to focus on and keep in our minds is the idea of repentance and atonement. Those are the two key things that, that are focused on at this time of the year. You know that the month of Elul, which is the month that was just prior to this one, is a whole month of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and, and you know clothing yourself in sackcloth and ashes and, and seeking repentance vigorously for that whole month leading up to this day. Because this day, according to Jewish tradition, what happens when the shofars are blown on Yom Teruah? Does anybody know? What does that do in the Jewish mind? David? Sorry, buddy, I'm just calling you out. He, he, he might have moved away from the machine. AFK, as they say. In the Jewish tradition, when the trumpet sounds blast on Yom Teruah, that means that the heavenly court is in session. The judges sit. The, the accuser stands up. God takes his throne. And he listens to the accuser of the brethren. Now, what's interesting about this, and I highly, highly suggest, for the sake of discussion, this whole week, read Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 is all about this, okay? Because the Jews say that on Yom Teruah, when the trumpets sound, the heavenly court is now in session. It's like banging a gavel. Here now, here now, the, the judge is, is, you know, he's coming in, he's sitting down, he's fluffing his robe, he's sitting down, and he smacks the gavel. Court is in session. The heavenly courts are called together for the court hearing, and the adversary is about to present his evidence against you. And that there will be a series of arguments. You'll have an opportunity to present your case, to seek repentance, and then on Yom Kippur, the judgment is sealed. The decision is made. Now, this is very frightening. It's very serious, okay? But when you look at the, Hebrew, the Hebrew's account of Yeshua becoming our high priest, what is the high priest's job? To deal with the sins of the people. And if Yeshua is our high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, and he is in the heavenly places right now, standing in front of the heavenly court, rebuking and pushing back against your adversary. Do you see where this picture is taking us, okay? The trumpets are blown, the heavenly court is in session. There's some trial and jury selection <laughs> and courts, you know, cases being made against you and Yeshua standing there, you're not present. Yeshua is standing there at the Father saying, this one's mine. This one's mine. My blood covers him. My blood covers him. He has accepted my sacrifice. So read Hebrews 7. Angela, I apologize. Uh, come and get it. Come on, come on over and tell us what you got. Yes, you do. No, no, it's all good, go man. There. It's all good. Yeah, yeah, you bring it in, bring it in. You just said um, that the trumpet was like the gavel and court is in session mm -hmm. and the accuser is standing there yep. and Yeshua is standing there. 
Well, we just finished Zechariah 2 going into 3, and it says, Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. I picture yeah. the judge walking in, and okay, so the gavel. That right? is a and very then it says, common interpretation of that passage in Judaism. Then it says, He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. This mm -hmm. sounds like a it trumpet's. Is type of event. I, okay. I mean, I think it is. And in fact, that's a very common interpretation within Judaism that that passage in Zechariah that we were just studying last week is about Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. Uh, I think that's a very real argument to make. I think it lines up beautifully. Thank you for bringing that, uh, bringing that in, Angela. Absolutely. Um, so this heavenly court is called to order and each life is examined for the, for the previous year, and evidence is weighed, and the accuser accuses, and, and you know we grovel and say we're sorry, and, and, and repentance is intensified during these days of awe, these ten days between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. There's also some interesting parallels between uh, regarding these ten days, and in the book of Revelation, I'm sure you've probably read a little bit about that, there's some, some very interesting things happening there. Do you remember, did anybody remember anything from the book of Revelation that talks about 10 days? Prison. Yes. The adversary will throw you into prison for 10 days. That's an interesting parallel. So take a look at that. There's a lot of really interesting relationships between these passages. Um, so we have these days of awe. And I want to, at this point read to you just a brief selection of the Shlikot prayers that are said every single day. They've got a pretty thick little booklet, you know, in the prayer, uh, uh, the prayer booklet. And this is the Shlikot for the beginning of these 10 days of awe. And I'm going to read to you just briefly a couple of these things. It's quite fascinating. It says, Yuva, Yuva our Elohim, is merciful and gracious, endlessly patient, loving and true, showing loving kindness for a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, and granting pardon. For the sin that we have committed against you under duress or by choice, for the sin we have committed against you consciously or unconsciously, for the sin we have committed against you openly or secretly, for the sin we have committed against you by hating without cause. For the sin we have committed against you in business. For the sin we have committed against you by hurting others in any way. For all these, God of forgiveness, forgive us, pardon us, grant us atonement. We have sinned against life by failing to work for peace. We have sinned against life by keeping silent in the face of injustice. We have sinned against life by ignoring those who suffer in distant lands. We have sinned against life by forgetting the poor in our midst. We have failed to respect the image of our Elohim in every human being. We have withheld our love from those who depend upon us. We have engaged in gossip and slander. We have distorted the truth for our own advantage. We have conformed to fashion and not to conscience. We have indulged in despair and trafficked with cynics. We have given little support to houses of study. We have neglected our heritage of learning. We have sinned against ourselves and paid little heed to the life of the Spirit. For all these, our God of forgiveness, forgive us, pardon us, and grant us atonement. That's just a small section of the prayers that are prayed on day one of the ten days of awe. Most Christians have as their preconceived idea that Jews rely upon their observance of the Torah to be saved. This is absolutely false. It is not true in any sense. You have to notice and recommend that you read a little bit if you want to dig into it. That is a slander against the Jews. They rely on grace and mercy and forgiveness just as much as you do. You know what you're trusting in. They don't. They're still waiting for it, right? Do they believe in Messiah? Yes, they do. Do they believe the Messiah is going to come and sacrifice an atonement for sin? Yes, many of them do. 
They just don't know his name. You do. They're still waiting for him. You're still waiting for him too. But you know the historical Yeshua. They don't. So they're relying on their heavenly father to forgive their sins. And they're calling out to him, especially intensely during these days of the 10 days of awe leading up to Yom Kippur. So, these passages are quite powerful. I want to share something with you, and I'm going to go uh, on to a couple of scriptures, and I would like for each of us to read a little portion, okay? Hayden, would you do me a favor? Would you grab that microphone and be ready to run? I want, and, and I want you to, if you can read it from your Bible, that's great. If you want to read it from the screen, that's fine as well, okay? I'm going to put it up on the screen, but if you want to just follow along, we're going to read selected portions from the book of Joel, chapter 2. Open your Bibles to the book of Joel, chapter 2. We're not going to read the whole chapter. It's quite large. I really seriously contemplated reading the whole chapter because it's absolutely awesome. We should. Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's quite long, though. I've got the selected portions of the book of Joel chapter 2 because I think it's really, really powerful. Those, uh, those of you who are in-house, if you want to read it from the screen, you can. But, uh, and if anybody online uh, has a good uh, stentorian voice and would like to read a little passage, I'd be delighted to have that too. So, uh, the first one is right at the beginning of the book of Joel, okay, chapter 2. The book of Joel chapter 2. Now, here's what I've got. Um, I am going to let Hayden, you start by reading this right here. Joel chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 3, I think it is. Go ahead. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it, to the years of many generations. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, now, hand that microphone over to, uh, what's her name? Whoever that is. <laughs> well, pick one. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and now, yeah, 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 you ready? Okay, here comes the I next start? section. The section that you're going to read is starting in verse 11. Okay. Just verse 11. Okay. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and, the mi and mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? Very nice, very nice. Okay, <clears throat> give that to Evan. Verse 12 and 13. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, and with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. Now return to Yah your Lord, your Elohim, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Excellent. You want to do it? You ready to rock? Bring that over here. I got lots of children who need reading practice. You got it? You want to read it from up here or do you want to read it out of your book? Whichever you want. It's right here. Whatever works best for you. Verses 14, just verse 14. Nice and loud. What? Nice and loud. 14. Who knows whether he will not Torn and relent. relent and leave in blessing behind him, even a green, green <coughs> gra grain offering. offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Nice. Very nice. All right. Who wants to go next? Do I have anybody online who would like to read this next portion? 
This is a, a, a slightly larger one. It's verses 15 through 17, it looks like. Anybody online want to read that for me? Bunch of slackers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who is it? What's the other girl? What's your name? Crystalline. Crystalline, yes, Crystalline. Where'd the, bo where'd the boys go? Are they hiding out? You ready? You want to do one? You lie like a rug. <laughs> you can't true it. You can't trick me. All right, who is it? You ready to rock? This is yeah. verse. It's a little bit large. It's fifteen through seventeen. I think it's seventeen. Okay. You go, girl. Blow the tr uh, trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants, let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber, let the priests of the Lord minister, Lord's ministers um, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they among the people say, where is the Lord their God? Yes, delightful. Good one. Very good. Very good. And here's verse 28 and 29. Uh, Deb? Deb, do it up, sister. Let's see what Deb's got. That's right. And it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, and even on the male and female servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. Delightful, delightful. And here comes, who is it? It's uh, Jason. Jason, you ready to rock? You can read it from up here or down there, however you want. This is verses 30 through 32, I believe. I think that this comes really close to the end. Look at that, dude. Jason, look at that. And I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth. No, get the microphone up close to your pie hole. <laughs> <laughs> blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of... Yahuwah comes and it will come about that whoever calls on the name of Yahuwah will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as Yahuwah has said, even among the survivors whom Yahuwah calls. Delightful. Yes. Delightful. Now, that, there he is. What's up? Hey, hey brother. You know Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank Same you here. so much for coming out. Find a chair for this gentleman. All right. So, uh... That is our passage from Joel chapter 2. A fascinating passage. Hayden, you can take that over there. Now, question for you. Now, I, I heartily recommend that you read all of Joel chapter 2 for this next 10 days and check it out and see what you think. But I want to ask a question to you, and that's about tone, the tone of this holy day and this holy period. What is what does that suggest to you? Is it joyous? Is it terrifying? Is it humbling? See, that's what I'm curious about. Hey, do you have the microphone? Both. Both. Yes, I think that's as your mother would say, the answer is always yes. <laughs> Both. <laughs> the answer is always yes. Both. That's a great answer. Um there is some fear and reverence mixed in here. And there's also hope and joy. And I think as we look at some of the Greek scriptures to get a little bit more insight, this is where we're going to see even more of this same mixing of these, uh, a little trepidation mixed with a little hope and joy. Let's take a look at that. I want you to open with me, if you will, uh, to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 15. This is very, very directly related to this passage. The Holy Spirit is moving in the apostles and the elders and is revealing some of these mysteries by His Spirit 
in regard to these holy days that previously had been hidden in Messiah. These are some of those things that angels long to look into that Peter tells us about. So here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 15 and, and starting in verse 50. It says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. This is Paul interpreting the Tanakh passages of the Old Testament regarding Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. He's seeing it more clearly. He says that this mystery has been revealed. Okay, let's check out a different one. Look at 1 Thessalonians. You definitely know this one. This is 1 Thessalonians verse 4. Chapter 4, excuse me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 says, For this we say to you by the word of the Master, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Master shall not go before those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. For the Master himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of Elohim. And the dead in Messiah shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Master in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Master. Therefore, comfort another, one another with these words. We're seeing a clearer picture. We're seeing some fascinating connections being made here. We're getting a clearer picture by the Spirit of Yah given through these apostles to reveal how these last three will be revealed. Fascinating stuff. And I want to share with you just a couple more. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's just the next chapter over. And this one is from 1 Thessalonians 5, starting right at the top of verse 1. It says, Now, as to the times and the epochs, we've often misinterpreted that to be summer, winter, fall, and spring, the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Master will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. Skipping to verse 9. For Elohim has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Master, Yeshua the Messiah, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Are these encouraging words? These are very encouraging words. These are very encouraging words. And I think very clearly as we read through Joel, you can see that there is great destruction, but there's also great salvation at the same time. Now, the Messiah Yeshua himself talked a little bit about this and even quoted from the second chapter of Joel. And the next passage I want to look at with you is Matthew 24. Look at Matthew 24 verse 29, where Yeshua digs even a little bit deeper. He is, I think, very clearly telling us even more. He's elucidating by the power of the Spirit even more about what we heard from Joel. In Matthew 24 and 29, he says, However, immediately after the tribulation of those days, that's a tricky phrase, <laughs> it's a tricky phrase. 
Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. We have some fascinating passages about trumpets being blown. So now you can clearly see this picture of the Messiah Yeshua in all likelihood will return to this planet on this very day. Maybe not this very day, because we haven't sighted the moon yet. So, you know what I'm saying, though. The first day of the seventh month is very likely when Yeshua will return to this planet to gather you, if you are still alive. If you die prior to that, you're going first. Those who are left alive will not precede those who have already died. But remember that the this is something that's quite fascinating and has tripped up our Christian brothers and sisters for so long is when does the Messiah Yeshua say that he is returning with this great trumpet sound? After the tribulation. We have often for so long labored under the delusion that we were, we misinterpreted that we were not destined for wrath. We are not destined for wrath. We are destined for tribulation. Because <laughs> he said, you were going to experience tribulation. They treated me badly, they're going to treat you badly. This, and I've mentioned to you before that this tribulation is for you. It's just for you. It's a special, special treat. Just for you. Because why? Why, why, why do we need tribulation? Yes. Because we need to be tested. Many of us are lackadaisical and we're just kind of farting around. We ain't paying attention. We're just doing our own thing. We're getting caught up in the ways of the world. We're caught up in our own stuff. We're caught up in money. We're caught up in television. We're caught up in culture. We're doing other stuff. We're not really paying attention. This is precisely why life in Egypt got kind of difficult. And I've mentioned to you before that if he hadn't made life difficult for them in Egypt, I think most of them would have been perfectly happy to stay there. Would have been just fine. Just like when they went, got exiled to Babylon, most of them stayed there. Why do you think a good chunk of world Jewry is right here in the United States and has not returned to the Holy Land? Because it's better here. It's easier here. It's cheaper to live. Got more freedom. See what I'm saying? We're all a little bit conflicted about what we really want. Many of us are getting a little political, thinking, you know, I think we can save this thing. <laughs> if we get this guy elected, we can fix this thing. We can preclude Yeshua from having to come back. Guys, I've told you before, you ain't fixing this thing. It's got to go right down the toilet. It has to. It has to. What? It's going, yeah, you can see it. So you know what? If you see it going down the toilet, don't chase it down there. <laughs> Seriously, don't follow it. Gracie, who's got the microphone? Somebody give Gracie. There, she's got it. Yeah, go ahead. It just makes me think. He, he's warning us, and we have been taking it wrong, but at the same time, we need to occupy till he comes. Yes. And so he's showing us, yeah, you're going to live through it, but you are going to live through it. Yes, and I think you made a good point there. You said, occupy until I come. What are you occupying? Wall Street? No. The truth, no. The truth in the Word. You're occupying the space you inhabit. Yeah. I was talking to the boys about this earlier to this very day. Saying, look guys, whatever's going on out there in the world, that's none of you. That's none of your business. Doesn't have nothing to do with you. You guard and protect you. 
and the people around you. Your job, your mission is the only thing you can control, which is you. You got no business being involved in what's going on out there because it's all going down the crapper. You don't need to worry about that. However, we did talk about, you got a responsibility. You live in a democracy, so to speak, maybe. Does your vote count? I don't know. But you, that's, you should vote. Why not? Is it going to matter? I don't know. I don't know when Father's going to send his son back here. If we got to wait for a while yet, exert your influence. But don't get caught up in the result. Because it ain't going to matter. <laughs> it's, none of your, it's none of your business. Fight for your own little protective bubble around you and your family and your friends and your whatever you have control over. That's the important thing. Would that be like keeping your armor in place? Yes. He says, would that be like keeping your armor in place? Yes. Keep your spiritual armor in place. Yes. You can protect yourself and those you love by following his instructions and repenting. I want to encourage each one of you right now, after having reviewed some of these passages, I think that we need to be immensely careful that we don't get presumptuous about the fact that Yeshua has died for our sins. Don't be presumptuous about that. You should very much latch on to that, but you should not presume, okay? What does the first John tell us regarding forgiveness and transgression? If we are faithful to what? Repent. Repent and turn away from sin, He is faithful to forgive us of sin. Where do you think the Catholics got this idea that you better repent before you die? Okay, I, I don't need to pay that close attention. I'm not, I, man, I forgot to go to a confession today, and now I got in a car accident, and I'm dead, I'm going to hell, you know? I'm going to purgatory, whatever. No, 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 no. Let us not, like unfortunately many people do, say, I met Yeshua when I was 12. He took away all my sins. I don't never need to talk about it again. It's done. Now, is that true? Will Yeshua cover all your sins? Yes. Do I say it once and then go about my business? No. 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 That's very... You're skating on some dangerous thin ice if you presume and you're arrogant in your arrogation to yourself of, I've got the blood of Jesus covering me. I can't do no wrong. Don't think that way. Think, I did any of you sin today? I'm pretty sure I did. I'm mean, guaranteed. Guarantee I sinned today. I talked trash about somebody. I thought a bad thought. I thought evil of somebody, whatever it was. I'm sure I did it multiple times. I need to ask Father to appropriate the blood of Yeshua to cover my sins every single day. I need to keep a short leash on my sins because they're ever present. They're always trying to trip me up. So is there some special thing about this time of year where we need to be especially repentant? What are your thoughts on that? Is this time of year special that we need to be more especially repentant at this time of year than any other time of year? doesn't hurt it if hey if this time of year only brings to your attention oh you know i might i might need to think about this you know if not for this 10 days you know if you've been blowing it off and hadn't really been thinking about it much for the other however 345 days of the year 55 days of the year it might be a good time to just pay attention for 10 days couldn't possibly hurt you, right? To just recognize, I got the. If this is true, and the adversary's up there talking trash about me and telling about telling the father like he don't know all the stuff that I did over the last year, gosh, I may want to con contemplate that. So, I think why not? Why not? Do we have to engage in the idea that oh yeah, there's a heavenly court and a gavel? No, it's a picture. It's not necessarily to be taken literally. It's a picture. Is it literal? I, don't, I have no idea. I, could, I, I don't know what goes on in heaven. 
that's totally outside my realm. I go, I have no clue. Doesn't matter whether it's true or not. What matters is what's your attitude regarding forgiveness and sin and the atonement that you must have. Yeshua must cover your sins because you don't have somebody who can do it for you. Right? The Levitical priest can't do it for you. Animal sacrifice can't do it for you. We've talked about that before. And next Sunday, Tracy is going to be discussing that with us in regards to Yom Kippur, Yom HaKippurim. It's going to be a, a fascinating discussion. So, here's my question to you. After having contemplated this and read a few passages and see how this day is characterized both in the Tanakh and in the Greek scriptures. How should we approach this day? We're going to blow our trumpets. I know it's not actually the Feast of Trumpets until tomorrow evening, but we're here to celebrate it. Blow it again tomorrow. <coughs> how should we approach this day? I want to bring you an analogy before we do that. There are two prisoners both are condemned to death. They are both murderers. And they have both been found guilty and charged with the death penalty. Just before sentence can be carried out, one of them is pardoned of his crime. Only one of them. On what basis? I have no idea. The judge decided this one gets to live for reasons that are only known to him. And then the execution is carried out upon the other individual. What is the attitude of the individual who has been granted a stay of execution? Is he going to jump up and down and hoot and holler and go yee-haw standing in front of the guy who's just about to be slaughtered? That would be very inappropriate, I think. <laughs> if me and this guy next to me have just been sentenced to death and the judge says, you know what, Alan? I'm going to let you live. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Me? Why? I killed somebody too. Don't worry about why. I have decided that you're going to live. But he's going to die. Huzzah! How's that guy going to feel? That's just not very nice. I'm not being respectful. What am I going to do? I'm going to fall on my face. And I'm going to be weeping. And I'm going to feel really bad for that guy. See what I'm saying? Now, what is your attitude toward the, the day of trumpets? You heard what Joel said about the day of Yah, which is the day that these trumpets are being blown. You've read all these passages in the, in the Tanakh about the day of the Lord. That's terrifying. It's horrifying. It's frightening. But you get to be snatched out of the flame like a brand plucked out of the fire. Where does that come from? Isn't this a brand plucked out of the fire? That's Joshua the high priest from the book of Zechariah that we're studying right now. You are like a brand plucked out of the fire, rescued from the flames. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What's your attitude? My attitude is, hmm, I take some introspection. I apologize if I have robbed you of your joy of blowing the shofar, but I want you to blow that shofar with mindfulness. <laughs> I want you to blow that shofar with a true sense of what is happening here. Not with a sense, you should have joy. You should have joy, you should have peace, you should also have great humility. You should be very conscientious about what has been granted you, what has been given you, and for whatever reason, there's tremendous destruction all around you. It's going to be tough for you to be hooting and hollering. Yeshua says, when you see all these things taking place, what should you do? Look up. Look up. Because your redemption is drawing nigh. He doesn't taste, do cartwheels, hoot and holler, put on your pom-poms. I don't think that would be the right approach. 
Make sense? Sorry to bring you down. <laughs> I'm sorry to bring you down, but I want you very much to contemplate this, the gravity of the situation. Yeshua shows up in the sky on the clouds with the Son of Man coming in glory. I don't know that I'd have the presence of mind to be happy. I'm going to be on my face. I really think I'm going to be on my face. If I happen to be alive, when Yeshua returns, I will fall on the ground. I will fall on the ground. That's it. Now, I'm going to suggest that we take very seriously for the next 10 days at least, preparing our hearts, seeking, actively seeking repentance. What are you doing that you know you shouldn't do? Ask for forgiveness. Pull yourself together. Seek the presence of the Holy Spirit to empower you and strengthen you to overcome. Okay, that would be my, my greatest hope for you. Yom HaKippurim is next Sunday. Um, like I said, I, I strongly suggest reading. The whole book of Hebrews is all about Yeshua as our high priest, after the order of Melchizedek. The whole book. Especially chapter 7. Read chapter 7. I highly recommend it for the next 10 days. Read it every day. Um, and then read Deuteronomy 16. Okay, because Deuteronomy 16, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll share with you. No, not Deuteronomy 16, excuse me. Deuteronomy 23, 34. I'm going to share this with you because this is the one that is coming up uh, on the 15th day of this month, which is Sukkot. Now, this is joy. This is the festival of our joy. Leviticus 23, 34 says, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month is the feast of Sukkot, for seven days to Yah. On the first day is a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work of any kind. For seven days you shall present an offering by fire to Yah. On verse 39, on exactly the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the crops of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of Yah for seven days with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. Now on the first day, you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before Yah your Elohim for seven days." You thus shall celebrate it as a feast to Yah for seven days in the year. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall live in Sukkot for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in Sukkot so that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in Sukkot when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am Yah your Elohim. That's coming up, ladies and gentlemen, and that is a feast of joy. It is commanded that you be joyous on that occasion. Why is it commanded? Do you ever wonder about that? Why is it commanded that you be joyful on the Feast of Sukkot? I have a feeling, do you remember in the days of, like you were there, in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra when they were celebrating Sukkot, and what were the people doing when they discovered the book of the law and they had not done this Sukkot for a long time and the temple wasn't in good condition? What did they do? They wept. They were grieved. And the priests and the Levites went among them and saying, no, 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 no. Don't cry. This is not a time for crying. It's almost like, yeah, and they, yes. Yes, and so I think it's possible. Consider that Yeshua fulfilled the spring feasts of Yah in what, how, what period of time? How long? I mean, from the, I mean, he died on what, what high, what high Shabbat? Passover. Passover, right? When was he resurrected? Three days later on Yom HaKippurim, right? And then... First fruits. First fruits. That's Yom HaKippurim. No, no, sorry. No, 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 no. Yeah, the Bikarim, not HaKippurim. Sorry, <laughs> I misspoke. So three days later, we got the first fruits offering. 
And then how much later did the, the, did the Holy Spirit come down in Jerusalem? 50 days. So Yeshua fulfilled all of the spring feasts in a period of how many days? 50, 60 at the most? Short period of time. Now, what do you think is going to happen when he returns? It's going to be fulfilled in how many days? 15 days. The Yom Teruah on the first day of the seventh month. Ten days later, Yom HaKippurim. Five days later, the Feast of Sukkot. What's going to happen on those days? Going to have to wait until we study them on the next, <laughs> those next days. Tracy's going to talk about Yom HaKippurim, and then I'm going to teach uh, for Sukkot. And those are... The, think about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yeah. That great feast. That's Sukkot. Yeah. Think about the judgment seat. Judging the nations. The wrath of Elohim. That's Yom Kippur. Yeshua comes... Just play with me for a second in your mind. Yeshua comes and snatches His people and raises them from the dead. Over the next ten days is a very hairy period. Then you got a short five-day window until Messiah gathers His people back in the land and there is a holy Sukkot. Five days later. It's all happening very quickly. Very quickly. Okay. Now, is there a tribulation period prior to the Feast of, of, of Yom Teruah? That's what Yeshua said. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the Son of Man appears in the sky. So, how long is that, how long is that tribulation period prior to the day of Yom Teruah? Many people will say seven years, but it's not. How many years is it? Three and a half years. Unless you want to consider that perhaps those days will be shortened. Don't know. Fascinating ideas, and we'll talk more about those. Uh, but I just want to encourage you to A, humbly seek Yah during these next 10 days. Couldn't possibly hurt you. Give Him great praise and thanks for sending the Messiah Yeshua to die for your sins. And then prepare, you got a five-day window to, be, to breathe a sigh of relief if you've had a humble and repentant attitude. Breathe that sigh of relief knowing that Yah forgives you of your sins under the blood of the Messiah covers you. And prepare your heart. And I think I brought this around. I'm bringing this around. I didn't forget. Why was he saying, stop crying? This is the Feast of Sukkot. What has just happened on Yom Teruah? What has just happened over that 10-day period between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur? Some terrible, tragic things. He's going to need to command you, be joyous. This is a time of rejoicing. You're going to need that encouragement because you're not going to feel like rejoicing. Have you ever gotten to Sukkot and just not exactly felt like rejoicing? There are multiple passages that say, rejoice, do it. It's an active command, rejoice. I don't know how many times I've come to Sukkot and it's just, man, I still got things weighing me down and lingering on me from the feast of Yom Kippur and, and, and trumpets, man, and that days of awe, I got stuff weighing me down and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not feeling it. I'm not ready for Sukkot. I don't feel like partying. I don't feel like feeling happy. But I always have to remind myself, be joyous. It's commanded. I think it's because you're going to need it. You're going to need it. And now is a great time to practice. And that really says something of, to me about one thing that you really need, all of us need to work on. That as we live through tribulation and difficulty, what are we going to need? Control of the battleground of the mind. When you're facing difficulty and trial and difficulty and tribulation and difficulty and twisting and testing and refining, it's hard to be at peace. It's hard to have a sense of joy. It's hard to be 
giving it all, considering it all joy, my brethren, when we encounter all these various trials. That's not easy. That takes mental toughness. And it's a great skill practice to say, I'm going to rejoice. I, am, I have to rejoice. I don't care how I feel. I don't care what the world is doing. I don't care what I feel like inside. I don't care what's going on in my life. I don't care what happened to my child. I don't care what's going on with my wife. I don't care what's going on with my job. I'm going to rejoice by an active, forced submission of the will to the Spirit. We just practice, you know, reading scriptures. And I don't care if you feel it or you don't feel it. We just say, thank you, Lord, for this. I'm yes. You. I don't feel it, but it doesn't make any difference. My spirit does, so I'm rejoiced. And you're not a hypocrite. You're just practicing the word until it comes, and then you'll be rejoiceful. Yes, rejoice. Be rejoicing always. Filling your mind with the words. Those words of encouragement, you need those really badly. So practice it. This is coming up. Great practice.